All right, so uh, I know we are over time, but I do want to open up the floor for for questions to any of our speakers. You had three excellent talks on different aspects of autonomous racing. So uh, please feel free to step up to the microphone here, or it's even better if you come where I'm standing so that these uh, guests can hear. come, come. We'll take a few questions. I know there's been questions online that speakers have been answering, but let's take at least two or three questions and then we can uh, break for lunch. Come. You can go after. Hey there, I have a short question for Professor Schwager. Um, I'm Elia I'm from the Robotics and Perception Group. We also work on drone racing, but but at the moment we only work on the time trial setting. I wanted to ask you if you have an estimate kind of in professional drone racing, how much multiplayer aspect is there actually? Because the track is huge, the drones are extremely small, the task is three dimensional. Uh, is, is there this, this aspect of blocking? Is, is it actually really a core concern or would a time optimal strategy already do a very good job in such a setting? What do you think? Oh. Okay, great. <laughs> awesome, thank you, Madhur. Uh, yeah, no, it's a great question. And I think, um, Probably uh, the way drone racing competitions are set up now, there's very little drone on drone interaction. I, I think you're right. Um, but I think for car racing, it's essential. I think this okay. is one of the most exciting and interesting aspects of car racing. And I think, you know, I, drone racing is still a young sport, whether it's autonomous or piloted. And I think probably the tracks will evolve and the, maybe the different you know, um, how do you say tiers of competition will evolve? Maybe there, maybe in the future there will be more of a focus on on drone on drone competition. But no, I, I think you're right. I think it, there's not really a significant threat of drone drone collision in in the way things are currently set up. Okay, thanks a lot. Sure. Uh, we have one more question. Yeah, come on up. Uh, hi, Mac. I have a question hi. for you as well. Oh, great. Um, so uh, I was wondering, what's the qualitative difference between uh, trajectories that are computed as open loop Nash equilibria, but implemented in a receding horizon fashion? Yeah. And uh, closed loop or react or closed loop or feedback Nash equilibria implemented reactively in the context of the driving yeah. problem? Yeah, that's a great, great question. Yeah, so all of the algorithms that I described were open loop, but closed loop through MPC, as you said, clearly you know what you're talking about. Um, but there's a, a, separate, a separate way of phrasing the problem, which is to parameterize a, a feedback policy and then optimize for a Nash equilibrium by finding the right parameters of the feedback policy. Um, I, so, so the short answer is this. Um, I don't know of any optimizer that can work fast enough to optimize the policy online, except for ILQ games, which is the one competing work or one, you know, existing liter say paper in the existing literature that that's com comparable to, to all games. Um, okay, so how do I organize my, my thoughts? So ILQ games sort of inherits as a as a as a residual a feedback policy, but it's not very practical as a feedback policy. Um, so is, it gets a feedback policy that's a local ILQR controller, um, very much like um, any, any planning method, like iterative ILQR also inherits a, a feedback controller. But that feedback controller is not a, a sufficient policy on its own. It still needs to be solved in receding horizon. Otherwise, it's essentially the, the neighborhood where the feedback is relevant is so small and the game is so likely to deviate from that neighborhood that it's not effective as a real feedback controller. Okay. It is over very short time scales, but not over the time scale of a full time horizon, a full planning horizon. So, and I think David Friedrich Kell, the author of that work would agree with me. So it's, the feedback is there, but it's not a really important aspect of how the controller works. It's really an MPC controller. Now, one could try to parameterize a real feedback policy as a deep network. And I have not seen that done um in the literature and i think the reason is because it's really it, essentially finding nash equilibria is computationally very difficult and i think that any policy that's optimized offline and simulation 
is very likely to when run online, it's very likely that the racing conditions will depart from the training set and it won't be effective. Right, right. We haven't done those experiments in the lab, but I expect that's what you'd find. I think in practice, you probably need an MPC style uh, policy. Yes. Although there could be other opinions out there and I'd, I'd love to see the literature. I'd love to see researchers prove me wrong on this. It would be really cool if you could solve offline for a closed loop policy. Right, right. Cool, thank you so much. Thanks. Okay, so uh, yeah, so maybe very quick a quick question to you, Alex. Uh, uh, you could keep it brief as well. So, since you're transitioning from the racetrack to the real world, in some sense, you're already in the real world, but to a more, let's say, uh, structured world than a racing track. Uh, <clears throat> from the perception to planning to control, which one of these translates the most to regular driving, in your opinion? Right, because because the kind of perception problems we experience at speeds is, isn't really what we would experience on the track. Also, the set of objects we have to detect in an urban situation is very different. So, so which one of these layers do you think is the easiest to to uh, you know do something outside of racing? Yeah, I think actually each of those layers has their pretty unique challenges in uh, transferring. And, the, and like in one sense, perception is very different. But let's say if you look at the methods you use, at the strategies you use, um, you can learn a lot from going from the racetrack to the real world. But you will not be able to actually like, yeah, directly take your model. So it's more like a methodological, uh, method, methodological learning you have at that point. If you look at the planning part, it's actually probably from my perspective, the most different one, because you have all of those traffic rules and these kind of things and um, which you don't have at the track. So obviously you have to really, let's say, design the algorithm to yeah, be, let's say, application agnostic to handle both of those situations, because there's a lot of opportunity, especially in the racing context, to overfit towards that scenario. And then it's going to be pretty hard to actually move the algorithms from the racetrack to the road. Yeah, okay. All right, so at this point, I have to uh, ask everyone to thank our speakers again. Thank you so much for joining us today.